Section One of the Judgment of Valhalla. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The Judgment of Valhalla, by Gilbert Frankau. The Judgment of Valhalla, the Deserter. I'm sorry I done it, Major. We bandaged the livid face and led him out ere the wan sun rose to die his death of disgrace. The bolt heads locked to the cartridge, the rifles steadied to rest. As cold stock nestled at colder cheek and foresight lined on the breast. Fire, called the sergeant major. The muzzles flamed as he spoke, and the shameless soul of a nameless man went up in the cordite smoke. End of poem. Section 2 of The Judgment of Valhalla by Gilbert Frankau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. The Judgment of Valhalla, The Eye and the Truth. Up from the fret of the earth world, through the seven circles of flame, with the seven holes in its tunic for sign of the death in shame. To the little gate of Valhalla, the coward spirit came. Cold, it crouched in the man-strong wind that sweeps Valhalla's floor. Weak, it pawed and scratched on the wood and howled like a dog at the door, which is shut to the soul's who are sped in shame for ever and evermore. For it snuffed the meat of the banquet boards where the threefold killers sit, where the free beer foams to the tankard rim and the endless smokes are lit. And it saw the naked eye come out above the lintel slit. But now it quailed at naked eye which judges the naked dead. And now it snarled at naked truth that broodeth overhead. And now it looked to the earth below where the gun flames flickered red. It muttered words it had learned on earth, the words of a black coat priest who had bade it pray to a pulpit god, but ever eyes wrath increased. And it knew that its words were empty words, and it whined like a homeless beast. Till, black above the lintel slit, the naked eye went out. Till, loud across the killer feast, it heard the killer shout. The threefold song of them that slew and died, and had no doubt. End of poem. Section 3 of The Judgment of Valhalla by Gilbert Frankau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. The Judgment of Valhalla The Song of the Red Edge Steel. Below your black priest heaven, above his tinseled hell, beyond the circle seven, the red steel killers dwell. The men who drave to blade ring home behind the marching shell. We knew not good nor evil, save only right of blade, yet neither God nor devil could hold us from our trade. 
when once we watched the barrage lift and splendidly afraid came scrambling out of cover and staggered up the hill the bullets whistled over our sudden dead lay still and the mad machine-gun chatter drove us fighting wild to kill then the death light lit our faces and the death mist floated red o'er the crimson cratered places where his outpost crouched in dread and we stabbed or clubbed them as they crouched and shot them as they fled and floundered torn and bleeding over trenches through the wire with a shrapnel barrage leading to the prey of our desire to the men who rose to meet us from the blood-soaked battle mire met them gave and asked no quarter but where we saw the gray plunged the edge steel of slaughter stabbed home and wrenched away till red wrists tired of killing work and none were left to slay now while his fresh battalions moved up to the attack screaming like angry stallions his shells came charging back and stamped the ground with thunder hooves and pawed it spouting black and breathed down poison stenches upon us leaping past panting we turned his trenches and heard each time we cast from parapet to parados the scything bullet blast till the whistle told his coming till we flung away the pick heard our lewis guns crazed drumming grabbed our rifles sighted quick fired and watched his wounded writhing back from where his dead lay thick so we labored while we lasted soaked in rain or parched in sun bullet riddled fire blasted poisoned fodder for the gun so we perished and our bodies rotted in the ground they won it heard the song of the first of the dead as it couched by the lintel post and the coward soul would have given its soul to be back with a red steel host but i peered down and it quailed at the eye and naked truth said lost and i went out but it might not move for droned in the dark it heard the second song of the killer men word upon awful word cleaving the void with a shrill keen sound like the wings of a pouncing bird end of poem Section 4 of The Judgment of Ahala by Gilbert Frankau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. The Judgment of Ahala, The Song of the Crashing Wing. Higher than tinseled heaven, lower than angels dare loop to the fray swoop on their prey the killers of the air we scorned the galilean we mocked a kingdom come the old gods knew our peon our dawn loud engine hum the old red gods of slaughter the gods before the jew 
we heard their cruel laughter shrill round us as we flew when deaf to earth in pity blind to the guns beneath we loosed upon the city our downward plunging death the sun god watched our flighting no christian priests could tame our deathly stuttered fighting the world drum spitting flame the roar of blades behind her the banking plane uptossed the swerve that sought to blind her maxed faces glimpsed and lost the joystick wrenched to guide her the swift and saving zoom what time the shape beside her went spinning to its doom no angel wings might follow where poised behind the fray we spied our lord apollo stoop down to mark his prey the hidden counter forces the guns upon the road the tethered transport horses stampeding as we showed dun hawks of death loud roaring a moment to their eyes and slew and passed far soaring and dwindled up the skies but even apollo's pinions had faltered where we ran lo through his veiled dominions to lead the charging van the treetops slathered under the red steel killers knew hard overhead the thunder and backwash of her screw the blurred clouds raced above her the blurred fields streaked below where waited crouch to cover the foremost of our foe banking we saw his furrows leap at us open wide hell raked the man-packed burrows and crashed and crashing died it heard the song of the dead in air as it huddled against the gate and once again the eye peered down red rimmed with scorn and hate for the shameless soul of the nameless one who had neither foe nor mate an eye was shut but naked truth bent down to mock the thing thou hast heard the song of the red-edged steel and the song of the crashing wing shall the word of a black coat priest avail at valhalla's harvesting shalt thou pass free to the seven halls whose life in shame was sped and truth was dumb but the brooding words still echoed overhead as roaring down the void outburst the last loud song of the dead end of poem section five of the judgment of valhalla by gilbert franco this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nemo the judgment of valhalla the song of the gunner dead in thor's own red valhalla which priest may not unbar but only naked truth and i last arbiters of war feast by stark right of courage the killers from afar we put no trust in heaven we had no fear of hell but lined and ranged in time to clock our barrage curtains fell when guns gave tongue and breech blocks swung and palms rammed home the shell the red steel ranks edged forward and vanished in our smoke back from his churning craters the gray man reeled and broke 
while fast as sweat could lay and set our rocking muzzles spoke we blew him from the village we chased him through the wood till tiny on the crest line where once his trenches stood we watched the wag of sending flag that told our work was good till red behind the branches the death sun sank to blood and the red steel killers rested but we by swamp and flood through murk and night his shells for light blaspheming choked with mud roped to the tilting axles man handled up the crest and wrenched our plunging gun teams foam flecked from jowl to breast downwards and on where trench lights shone for we we might not rest shell deafened soaked and sleepless short-handed under fire days upon nights unending we wrought and dared not tire with whip and bit from dump to pit from pit to trench with wire the killers in the open the killers down the wind they saw the gray man eye to eye but we we fought him blind nor knew whence came the screaming flame that killed us miles behind yet when the triple rockets flew skyward blazed and paled for sign the lines were broken when the red steel naught availed when through the smoke on shield and spoke his rifle bullets hailed when we waited dazed and hopeless till the layer's eyes could trace helmets bobbing just above us like mad jockeys in a race then loaded laid and unafraid we met him face to face jerked the trigger felt the trunnions rock and quiver saw the flail of our zero fuses blast him saw his gapping ranks turn tail heard the charging cheer behind us and dropped dead across the trail end of poem Section 6 of The Judgment of Ahala by Gilbert Franca. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. The Judgment of Ahala, Ahala's Verdict. It heard the song of the gunner dead die out to a sullen roar but naked truth said never a word and i peered down no more for i had seen and truth had judged and it might not pass the door and now like a dog in the dark it shrank from the voice of a man it knew there are empty seats at the banquet board but there's never a seat for you for they will not drink with a coward soul the stark red men who slew there's meat and to spare at the killer feasts where thor's swung hammer twirls there's beer and enough in the free canteen where the endless smoke upcurls there are lips and lips for the killer men in the hall of the dancing girls there's a place for any that passes clean but for you there's never a place the endless smoke would blacken your lips and the girls would spit in your face and the beer and the meat go sour on your guts for you died the death of disgrace 
we were pals on earth but by god's brave son and the bomb that i reached too late i damn the day and i blast the hour when first i called you mate and i'd sell my soul for one of my feet to hack you from the gate to hack you hence to the lukewarm hells that the priest made ovens heat or the faked pearl heaven of pulpit gods where the sheep-faced angels bleat and the halo's rim is as hard to the head as the gilded floor to the feet it heard the stumps of its one-time mate go waddling back to the feast and once and again it whined for the meat ere it slunk like a tongue-lashed beast to the tinseled heaven of pulpit gods and the tinseled hell of their priest end of poem section seven of the judgment of valhalla by gilbert franco this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nemo amy wife and country dear let me thank you for this that you made me remember and fight england all mine at your kiss at the touch of your hands in the night england your giving's delight end of poem section eight of the judgment of valhalla by gilbert franco this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Nemo Amy, Mother and Mate Lightly she slept, that splendid mother mine, Who faced death, undismayed, two hopeless years. Think of me sometimes, son, but not with tears, Lest my soul grieve, she writes, Oh, this divine unselfishness. Her favorite print smiled down. The stippled Cupid, Bartolozzi brown. Upon my sorrow, fire gleams, fitful, played among her playthings, Toby mugs and jade. And then I dreamed that, suddenly, strangely clear, a voice I knew not faltered at my ear. Courage, your own dear voice, loved since and known. And now that she sleeps well, come times her voice, whispers in daydreams. Courage, son, rejoice that, leaving you, I left you not alone. End of poem. Section 9 of The Judgment of Valhalla by Gilbert Franco. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Amy. Meeting. I came from the city of fear. From the scarred brown land of pain back into life again and i thought as the leave boat rolled under the veering stars wind a shriek in her spars shivering there and cold of music of warmth and of wine to be mine for a whole short week and I thought, a drowse in the train, of London suddenly near, and of how, 
small doubt i should find there as of old some woman foolishly kind fingers to hold a cheek a mouth to kiss and forget forget in a little while forget when i came again to the scarred brown land of pain to the sodden things and the vile and the tedious battle fret my dear i cannot forget not even here in this city of fear i remember the poise of your head and your look and the words you said when we met and the waxen bloom at your breast and the sable fur that caressed your smooth white wrist and your hands remember them yet here in the desolate lands remember your shy strange air and growing aware i who had reckoned love man's toy for an hour of love's hidden power a thrill that moved me to touch and adore some intimate thing that you wore a glove or the flower aglow at your breast the frill of fur that circled your wrist these had my hands caressed these not you had i kissed i who had thought love's fires only desires dear that hidden power thrills in me yet there is never one hour not even here in the city of fear when i quite forget End of poem. Section 10 of The Judgment of Valhalla by Gilbert Franco. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Amy, Music and Wine. When the ink has dried on the pen, when the sword returns to its sheath, when the world of women and men and the waters around and beneath char and shrivel and burn, what will God give in return? Has he better to offer in heaven above than wine and music, laughter and love? Laughter, music and wine the promise of love in your eyes sleeping i dream them mine waking my spirit cries here in the mud and the rain god give me london again i would lose all earth and the heavens above for just one banquet of laughter and love when my flesh returns to its earth when my pen is dust as my sword if one thing i wrought find worth in the eyes of our kindly lord i will only ask of his grace that he grant us a lowly place where his warriors toast him in heaven above with wine and music laughter and love end of poem section eleven of the judgment of valhalla by gilbert franco this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nemo amy the gamble if man backs horses 
plays cards or dice, or bets on an ivory ball. He knows the rules, and he reckons the price, be it one half crown or is all. And it isn't sense, and it isn't pluck, to double the stakes when you're out of luck. If he plays with his life for a limit here, it's an even money game. He can lay on the red, which is conquered fear, or the black, which is utter shame. And there isn't much choice between reds and blacks, for death throws zero, whichever he backs. So that weather man plays for the red gold's wealth with a little ball clicks and spins, or hazards his life in the black night's stealth when machine gun fire begins. It's a limited gamble, and each of us knows what he stands to lose ere the tables close. But woman's gamble? There's only one, and it takes some pluck to play. When the rules are broke ere the game's begun, when lose or win you must pay. Is a double wager on humankind a limitless risk? And she goes it blind. For she stakes at love on a single throw. Pride, honor, scruples, and fears. And dreams no lover can hope to know. And the gold of the after years. And all for a man. And there's no man lives. Who is worth the odds that a woman gives. So that since you hazard this for me, on the day love's die was cast, I'll love you, gambler, while fours beat three, and I'll lay on our love to last, so long as a man will wager a price on a horse or a card, or the ball or the dice. End of poem. Section 12 of The Judgment of Valhalla by Gilbert Franco. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Amy, Nino and Roses. Here, in a land where hardly are roses, silkiest blossoms of broidered flowers, Brush my cheek as each tired eye closes, Haunt my sleep through the desolate hours. Roses never of nature's making, Roses loved for a rose-red night, Roses visioned at dawnlight's breaking, Veiling a bosom as roses white. Why does the ghost of you linger and stay with me, ghost of the rosebuds that perfumed our bed, ghost of a rose girl who blossomed to play with me, here in a land where the roses are dead? Daytime and nighttime the death flower blazes, saffron at gun lip and orange and red. Here where June's rose tree lies shattered as mazes. Here where I dream of the nights that are dead. Nights that were sweet with the scent and the touch of you. Rose girl and Nino with buds at your breast. Rose girl who promised and granted so much of you. All that was tender and all that was best. Growl of the guns cannot shatter the dream of you, banish the thought of one exquisite hour, or the scent of your hair in the dawn, or the gleam of you, white as white roses, 
through roses a flower end of poem section thirteen of the judgment of valhalla by gilbert franco this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nemo amy parting times more than once all ways about the world have i clasped hands waved sorrowful goodbye watched far cliffs fading till my sea wakes swirled to mingle bluely with a landless sky then even as the sea drowned cliffs behind felt sorrow drowning into memory and heard in every thrill of every wind new voices welcoming across the sea until it seemed nor land nor love had power to hold my heart in any firm duress grieving i sorrowed but a little hour loving i knew desire's sure faithfulness until by many a love dissatisfied of each mistrustful and to each untrue i found as one who having long denied finds faith at last this greater love in you parting we are not parted woman mine though hands have clasped though lips have kissed goodbye though towns glide past and fields and fields of brine my body takes the warrior way not i i am still with you you with me one heart one equal union soul to certain soul time cannot sever us nor sorrow part nor any sea who keep our vision whole how can i grieve who know your spirit near who watch with newly understanding eyes this england of your giving newly dear sink where my sea wake swirls to darkling skies lilac her cliffs have faded into mist yet still i hold them white in memory feeling against these lips your lips have kissed the home wind thrilling down an english sea end of poem section fourteen of the judgment of valhalla by gilbert franco this librivox recording is in the public domain the other side just got your letter in the poems thanks you always were a brainy sort of chap though pretty useless as a subaltern too much imagination not enough of that rare quality sound common sense and so you've managed to get on the staff influence i suppose a captain too how do tabs suit you are they blue or green about your book i've read it carefully so has mcfadion you remember him the light-haired chap who joined us after lowes and candidly we don't think much of it the piece about the horses isn't bad but all the rest excuse the word are tripe the same old tripe we've read a thousand times my grief but we're fed up to the back teeth with war books war verse all the eyewash stuff that seems to please the idiots at home you know the kind of thing or used to know heroes who laugh while fritz is strafing them 
I don't remember that you found it fun, the day they shelled us out of Blauport Farm. After the fight, our cheery wounded, note the smile of victory, it won't come off. Of course they smile. So'd you, if you'd escaped and saw three months of hospital ahead. They don't smile much when they're shipped back to France. Out for the great adventure. Twenty-five fat, smirking wasters in some OTC who just avoided the Conscription Act. A strenuous woman worker for the cause. Miss Trixie Too Good of the Gaiety, who helped to pauperize a few Belgique in the great cause of self advertisement. Lord knows the newspapers are bad enough, but they've got some excuse the censorship, helping to keep their readers' spirits up, giving the public what it wants. Besides, one mustn't blame the press. The press has done more than its share to help us win this war. More than some other people I could name. But what's the good of war books if they fail to give civilian readers an idea of what life is like in the firing line? You might have done that much. From you, at least, I thought we'd get an inkling of the truth. But no, you rant and rattle, beach your drum, and blow your two-penny trumpet like the rest. Red battle's glory, honor's utmost task, gay jesting faces of undaunted boys, the same old boy's own paper balderdash. Mind you, I don't deny that they exist these abstract virtues which you gas about. We shouldn't stop out here long otherwise. Honor and humor and that sort of thing, though heaven knows where you found the glory touch, unless you picked it up at GHQ. But if you'd common sense, you'd understand that humor's just the Saxon cloak for fear, our English substitute for Vive la France, or else a trick to keep the folk at home from being scared to death, as we are scared. That honor, damn it, honors the one thing no soldier yaps about, except, of course, a soldier poet, three and six pence net. Honest to God, it makes me sick and tired to think that you, who lived a year with us, should be content to write such tommy rot. I feel as though I'd sent a runner back with news that we're being strafed like hell, and he'd reported, Everything okay. Something's the matter. Either you can't see, or else you see and cannot write. That's worse. Hang it. You can't have clean forgotten things you went to bed with, woke with, smelt and felt. All those long months of boredom streaked with fear, mud, cold, fatigue, sweat, nerve strain, sleeplessness. And men's excreta viscid in the rain, and stiff-legged horses lying by the road, their bloated bellies shimmering green with the flies. Have you forgotten? You who dine tonight in comfort at the Carlton or Savoy? Lord, but I'd like a dart at that myself. Oysters, creme something, sole vin blanc, a bird, and one cold bottle of the very best, a girl to share it, afterwards a show, Lee White and Alfred Lester, Nelson Keys, supper to follow. 
our brigade's in rest, the usual farm. I've got the only bed. The men are fairly comfy, three good barns. Thank God they didn't have to bivouac after this last month in the salient. You have forgotten, or you couldn't write this sort of stuff. All can't, no guts in it, hardly a single picture true to life. Well, here's a picture for you. Montauban. Last year, the flattened village on our left. On our right flank, the raised briquetterie, their five nines pounding bits to dustier bits. Behind a cratered slope with batteries crashing and flashing, violet in the dusk, and prematuring every now and then. In front, the ragged Bois de Bernefe, Boucher whizbangs bursting white among its trees. You had been doing FOO that day. The staff knows why we had an FOO. One couldn't flag wag through Tronus wood. The wires went down as fast as one could put them up. And messages by runner took three hours. I got the wind up rather you were late. And they'd been shelling like the very deuce. However, back you came. I see you now. Staggering into mess. A broken trench. Two chalk walls roofed with corrugated iron. And, round the traverse, driver Noki's stove, stinking and smoking while we ate our grub. Your face was blue-white, streaked with dirt. Your eyes had shrunk into your head, as though afraid to watch more horrors. You were sodden wet with greasy, coal-black mud and other things. Sweating and shivering, speechless there you stood. I gave you whiskey, made you talk. You said, Major, another signaler's been killed. Who? Gunner Andrews, blast them. Oh my Christ, his head split open. When his brains oozed out, they look like bloody sweetbreads in the muck. And you're the chap who writes this clap-trap verse. Lord, if I had half your brains, I'd write a book. None of your sentimental platitudes, but something real, vital, that should strip the glamour from this outrage we call war. Showing it naked, hideous, stupid, vile. One vast abomination. So that they who, coming after, Till the ransom fields where our lean corpses rotted in the ooze, Reading my written words should understand this stark, stupendous horror. Visualize the un utterable foulness of it all. I'd show them, not your glamorous, glorious game, which men play jesting for their honor's sake, a kind of military tournament with just a hint of danger, bound in cloth. But war, as war is now and always was, a dirty, loathsome, servile murder job. Men, lousy, sleepless, ulcerous, afraid, toiling their hearts out in the pulling slime that wrenches gum boot down from bleeding heel and cakes in itching armpits, navel, ears. Men stunned to brainlessness and gibbering. Men driving men to death, and worse than death. Men maimed and blinded, men against machines. 
flesh versus iron concrete flame and wire men choking out their souls in poison gas men squelched into the slime by trampling feet men disemboweled by guns five miles away cursing with their last breath the living god because he made them in his image men so were your talent mine i'd write of war for those who coming after know it not and if posterity should ask of me what high what base emotions keyed weak flesh to face such torments i would answer you not for themselves o oh, daughters grandsons sons your tortured forebears wrought this miracle not for themselves accomplished utterly this loathliest task of murderous servitude but just because they realized that thus and only thus by sacrifice might they secure a world worth living in for you good night my soldier poet dorme bien end of poem section 15 of the judgment of valhalla by gilbert franca this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. One of them. One. Being in some respects a sequel to one of us, wherein the bard, released from war's confusions, preludes with egotistical allusions. Six years ago, or is it six and twenty how vast the gulf from those ecstatic days when the whole earth snored on in slothful plenty though poets cashed small pittance for their lays when war appeared less real than g a henty and oxo's snaky signs were yet ablaze when all seemed peaceful as the press of cadbury and no one dreamed of bombs or bet a bradbury or ever stern mars had roped us in his tether our british guns had thundered at le cateau we fitted out my muse and i together and launched adown the galley slips of chateau a bark of verse full rigged for halcyon weather which many a critic judged to take the gateau though some there were high pundits of disparity who wept at our unscholarly vulgarity we have sailed far since then crossed our horizon published our loves in travels in a novel a tale men say the peckham's flapper cries on so that both boots and smiths before us grovel and eaten ration bully beef with flies on and sheltered gratefully in many a hovel what time we sang of guns and gore and trenches instead of oysters tango teas and wenches for times have changed since we wrote one of us et no mutamus more or less in ilis muse finds herself in urbe somewhat bruce and i if i disport with amaryllis where once my motor flashed prefer a bus and shuddering note how vast the supper bill is and signing sigh in secret for the calm chaste 
cheap seclusion of my Chiltern farm. Yes, Muse and I are tired and super serious. Her damask cheek is lined a bit and wrinkled. We are grown old, and London's late nights weary us, while the gold wine that erst in ice pale tinkled. Her doctor finds extremely deleterious. And mine forbids me red lips, passion crinkled. So now we cultivate domestic habits amongst our pigs, our poultry, and our rabbits. Yet sometimes, as we trench our stubborn soil, or feed our sows, or strow the peat moss litter, or set the morrow's chicken mash to boil, or wander out where our young turkeys twitter, or read by mellow candlelight, since oil is dear and scarce, or talk a little bitter, because we find that food control committees are all composed of men brought up in cities. Sometimes, in this five-acre paradise, whither my nerve-wracked spirit fled the battle, deferring to sound Harley Street advice, a silver badge, its only martial chattel. I hear a voice, loud as the market price, that butchers bid for Rondas missing cattle. Voice of my muse, still vibrant with old passion, telling how poetry is now the fashion. Look you, she cries, the wheels are turning, turning. Though Pegasus long since wore out his pinions, somehow his shod hooves keep the bread mills churning. Shrill night and day sing marsh Georgian minions. Each sinking sun sets some new noyes a burning. Each rising moon reveals fresh hordes of binions who batten fat on unsuspecting editors, and, unlike you, contrive to pay their creditors. Poet, forsooth, you agricultural brute, have you no soul above the weight of porkers? Was it for this I hearkened to your suit? Gave you my meters and my rhymes, some corkers? Up, Gilbert! Rummage out your rusty loot. Polish it blacker than your black Minorcas. And let its notes once more, in refluent stanzas, dower the income tax with glad bonanzas. So she, and, since I loath to disappoint, the least illusion of the equal sex, let Byron's oil once more these locks anoint, once more let honor meet these cocks drawn checks, though well I know that times are spare of joint, and satire's song less like to please than vex. Now small beer, small wood, raids and strikes and rations have near eclipsed the gaiety of nations. Still, let me sing, yet not as I once sung, Love, fear, and death, chastened, sobered, saddened. One who knew life's full burden time too young, whom never youth's unhampered freedom gladdened, but only envy and ambition stung, and fickle passions in love's semblance maddened, so that he needs must tumble now, poor clown, on this Pindaric stage for half a crown. Yet one who, spite a past that shocks St. Tony, and paid recording angels over time, still holds his own at sonnet or canzoni. As some shall know who follow this, my rhyme, some few, for gladly would I lay a pony, or larger some, against a ten-cent dime, 
that most of those who read this metered tractal not know a spondy from a pterodactyl. End of poem. Section 16 of The Judgment of Valhalla by Gilbert Franca. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. One of them, two, explains a task few modern penmen shirk, the sociology of this great work. God bless democracy, George Bernard Shaw, and William Dunn, our sanest, saintliest hatter. God bless that great anomaly, the law. I may our night's unhoarded tea wax fatter. God bless Sir Arthur Yap's unfailing jaw. Lord Lansdowne's pen and brave Horatio's chatter. And, lest in England bolos quite prevail, God bless King Northcliffe and his daily mail. Long live the old press, Times, DT, Spectator. Long live the new, Age, Europe, Statesman, Witness. Long live each acti temporis laudator. Long live Lloyd George in unmolested pitness. Long live the nation, facile demonstrator of everybody's, save its own unfitness. Long live Valera, Carson, Devlin, Plunkett. Long live the lads who fight, the cads who funk it. Long live our German banks, sub duce plunder. Long may our railways rule our bounding sea. Long may impatient Cuthbert's paw their fender. What time their patient Phyllis pours their tea. Long life to each investor and each spender. Long live the staff. Long live the ASE. So long as England's in the melting pot, a prudent bard must sing. Long live the lot. For who shall say, at close of Armageddon, when the world's finished beggaring its neighbor, when the last shell's been fired, the last pig fed on, if will be ruled by capital or labor, if a Welsh harp shall twang part songs of set on, while Simon pipes, a compromising tabor, or whether every stalwart war loan lender's son will find his empire dividends signed Henson. Not I, not all the better men who fought, while dilutees preserved their precious skin, not those great early dead whose single thought ran England. Germany, we've got to win. Poor simple souls of H. G. Wells untaught. They never realized their next of kin would read how they had died to make life cheerier for the dear blacks in brinningized Nigeria. Public, forgive your fool if now and then Black bubbles on the verses stream, appear thoughts of our worn, unlettered fighting men. If sometimes, through the grease paint's gay veneer, truth shows a wrinkled hag, the traitor pen forgets how blood is cheap and paper dear, and I'm no more the blithe, nut loving squirrel who frisked it in the consulship of Beryl. Which is, perchance, the reason why my mind turns off 
to those dear days, now dead as mutton. When Haldane's soul with Bethman Halwig dined, and no one ploughed up golf greens, sown by Sutton, to bed the humble tuber's sprouting rind, or dashed off shorthand billet doux in Dutton, or changed a blear-eyed pauper to a swell man in six short weeks of concentrated pelmen. Why now, sad minstrel in unsaddened sackcloth, I sing the twilight of the times I knew. No more our glaring footlights blur a black cloth, woven of misery and hung askew. For time, stern judge of us, has donned his black cloth, and to the mob delivered up the few. Unless, of course, the mobs but swapped its peers for a worst dynasty of profiteers. God knows we had our faults, greed, blindness, pride. God also knows we had a dashed good time. Were they the worse for that, our boys who died by earth and air and sea and every clime? God knows. But if ghost feet still strut inside about their clubs, if ghost eyes read this rhyme, I think they'd like their vanished epic swan song to be a merry tune and not a wan song. So clear the stage and ring the curtain up once more ere empires yield to leagues of nations and bayonets to socialistic gup. Let beauty and diaphanous creations ogle the stalls and subsequently sup off iced champagne and ortolan collations. Whereafter, if my pen won't bring me pelf, damned if I don't turn socialist myself. End of poem. Section 17 of The Judgment of Valhalla by Gilbert Franca. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. One of Them. Three. Sets forth, despite the law's dull interference, a lady's birth, age, family, and appearance. Arms have I sung full oft, both steel and white ones. Guns have I sung till I can sing no more. Men have I sung, both common and polite ones, yet never sang one heroine before. Come, then, my ghost girls, dark, fair, plump, and slight ones. Come in the finest, flimsiest frocks ye wore. Alas, not one of you quite fills the bill, a life-size model for my lady, Jill. Pardon, then, Magda, Gladys, Nancy, Florence, Doris, Patricia, Molly, Celandine, nor hold your erstwhile suitor in abhorrence, because from one he takes eyes subtly green. From other, Hands a sergeant or a Lawrence had envied for his canvas. Here, the sheen of gold hair, auburn shot, in whose abundance, what time Jill dreamed, young cupids watched the sun dance. There, a smooth throat, an arched, attractive ankle, soft cheek, curved back in bloom to close set ear. Red mouth full-lipped, a voice whose love tones rankle still in this heart of mine. A voice so dear that, but no more, in fear of this rhyming prankle, offend some damozel whom I revere. I state, Jill's just an ordinary blonde, fair, frail, flirtatious, rather fast 
than fawn. You know the type, aristo plutocratic, out of blue blood by hard north country cash, a self assertive sire, a dam lymphatic, since rarely strawberry leaves and sovereigns clash, their sole son daring in the diplomatic, thumping his underwood while kingdoms crash, their daughter. Is there a man alive can swear exactly what she did or did not dare? For Jill was one of those astounding females, born in a chaster pre-Edwarian day, when lone Lucindas dared not die nor tea males, for dread less scandal dubbed them Corifé. When none drank deep of D. Abernonian dream ales, but quietly our empire went its way, nor realized that subalterns on horses monopolized the brain power of its forces. One who is yet a span from flapperhood, still puzzling over the simplest of equations. What time in robe of saffron Phoebus stood, and all our lanes were gay with green carnations, in private handsomes sought the Jonian wood, and the shrill cycle bell's first tintillations resounded from the dawning to the dark in a rolls royceless Peter Panless park. One who attained the pigtail's ribbon dowry and helped to pass a Kipling tambourine, when first from lands of wattle, maple, maori, Men came at summons of a dying queen, one who, at Atulia, Dresden, and Rathgowrie, acquired that polish reft of which, I ween, it is not possible for our Dianas to emulate a modern grand dame's manners. One on whose head the ostrich feathers nodded, in Alexandrian courts, in Shea Bassano, in whose young ears songs angels disembodied rang the last notes of Melbourne's own soprano, whose lithe feet Moikoff shod, the grouse moors plodded, or danced the new Machichi Braziliano in times before unchaperoned of skinny ma suburbia's daughters sought the darkling kinema to put the matter briefly one of them bear witness muses nine how most unworthy is my gold nib to touch their garments hem say byron for his bard i still prefer thee to all whose pallid minor stars be gem these Gotha knights, would not such task deter thee from the rhymed octave, sometime known as whistlecraft, in which, poor ass, I ply this weekly thistlecraft? E me that I can never be a poet, modeled on spoon fed college Adonises, whose meters reek of porson, jeb enjoy it whose very thoughts derive from donish dasis alas for us who writing life must know it its sights its scents its ladies lords and laces alas for my refusal to disseminate even in verse the scholarly effeminate and, oh, ten thousand times, alas, should Jill be recognized in these Parnassian pages. Woe for the libel action and the bill which he must face who in the law engages. And, ah, thank heaven for a metric skill that shields this head from justice darling's rages. Safeguarded by thy last experience, G. Moore, I maiden name my lady, 
Lewis Seymour. End of poem. Section 18 of The Judgment of Valhalla by Gilbert Franca. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. One of them. Four. In which the author, contrary to custom, goes for the gloves as Sohrab went for Rustum. I have discovered, after much perusal, of Canaan, George Mackenzie, Walpole, Bennett, a law whose discipline brooks no refusal, a neo-rio literary tenet, which runs, in art, forbear to pick and choose, all that happens, happens. Wherefore, up and pen it. Let the scribe's tale be casual and cursory, and where you like, but start us in the nursery. And so I fain had traced, through many a canto, my heroine, all dimples in her cot, bored with her lessons, laughing at the panto, immersed in Fauntleroy or Walter Scott. But, since green herbs from memory's Campo Santo provide no flavoring for satire's pot, for a seething, bubbling cauldron such as this is, I'll skip the skipping rope and jump to kisses. Tis such a night as only London knew in the full seasons of our heart's content, when like some fairy pageant in review, love, pleasure, luxury together blent, made life not all too boring for the few, and unemployment fixed at ten per cent, furnished by all means of charity bazaars, right many a dame with perquisites and pars. London, in London's June, above the starshine below against the rails of berkeley square the patient lights of brougham or rare car shine waiting stiff-shirted squires and ladies fair music from high french windows that afar shine thrills till a dancer well might curse and swear and call himself a dashed, unlucky fella, to miss the Lewis Seymour's Cinderella. Within those halls, where plush breached flunkies stand, what sounds, what scents, what visions of delight, how, to the bluest blue Hungarian band, youth whirls away the unreturning night, how, perfumed as the blooms of Samarkand, the dying flowerets whisper, Carlton White. But, oh, to weary wartime ration hunters, how like a dream, this stand-up supper, Gunters. For here, in reach of every slender hand, which is scarce languidly outstretched a porcelain plate, our dainties drawn from each vale, stream, or strand, which is most famed for fruit or fish or fowl or cate. Cream strawberries, thin, lavish buttered sandwiches of livered geese that now squawk hymns of hate, of priceless hams and tongues and caviar, ices, and sugared sweets in myriad strange devices. Yet sweeter far than all these sweet things, Jill is, queen of my verse in this young people's dance, fairer than fairest of May fairy fillies, sweet is the smile that lights a countenance, bright is moon-dappled, pink-tipped lotus lilies, sweet 
are her jade green eyes that gleam and glance and give no hint of yester tea time's flare-up when stern mamma forbade her bind her hair up jill's hair how beautiful it is the tresses warm golden soft as signet's earliest downing jill's foot how slim the arch the flounce caresses jill's brow how pure how yet uncreased and frowning my muse how easily the jade impresses on this base coin a stamp of pseudo browning jill's youth jill's dreams these luxuries that lap her don't they present a most alluring flapper so thinks at least this lad in evening raiment shoes shirt front collar waistcoat buttons glowing this sub of other days when soldiers payment scarcely sufficed each monthly mess bills owing in triple stars full fifteen years delay meant he who presents the goblet overflowing with icy rubies to its crinkled brim and ask if jill won't sit this out with him and there it hangs word carven my last image browning again now keats o oh, hapless pair loath lover and bold maiden of a dim age lost to us now and dead but still most fair o oh, attic shapes arcadian girlhood's slim age and silken youth with brilliant tined hair what climaxes must i not sacrifice who write this epic at a weekly price for as long melodies are sweet but sweeter poems in short installments such as mine seven full days teased puppet of this meter must thy parched tongue await that roseate wine seven full nights fond boy must thou entreat her whilst mantle to her cheeks incarnadine youth's beauty beauty's youth and readers vexed no need no nothing more till tuesday next end of poem section nineteen of the judgment of valhalla by gilbert franca this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nemo one of them five brings life to weak old statues makes them prance to love's light tune and ends the seymour's dance pale shapes i locked in memory's studio your draperies stir from vein to marble vein the life-blood leaps eyes gleam and pulses glow once more my octaves wrap their old refrain to recreate the weekly puppet show fond boy to work my jill's herself again and answers your entreaty sideways glancing perhaps i will it's jolly hot for dancing so they twain pass smart sub and flapper stately from the high halls of gunter's pranked refection and out across the waxed boards where lately twirled the swift waltz to la poupée's selection and on past couples gossiping sedately and on past couples screened against detection to a dim-shaded fairy-lighted alcove fit haunt for single maid in single tall cove 
such as in land of taj mahal and mugger where girls book weeks ahead their supper dances screen some pale flirt some lad who yearns to hug her from the brown kitmatgar's averted glances who knows thy secrets darkling kala joga the orbs downcast the fingers coy advances the swiftly stifled sob that hooks the stripling save i victoria cross and rudyard kipling and there beneath the new sponged potted palm tree that midday brought and morning shall remove mayfair's own wind unruffled ever calm tree whose drooping branches shield mayfairy's love she lisps of waller parts and thy dead charm tree twin stars now shining in the flies above while he admits he has or hasn't seen them till a shy sudden silence falls between them a cloud across the sun of lightling banter o oh, jill my gold spoon cake and moet miss hast thou not dreamed since thy first tam o shanter of soldier boy of dance night such as this faintly they catch the polka's throb the canter of homing handsome cab where lovers kiss and oh thinks he what eyes what lips what hair too and oh thinks she the ninny doesn't dare to voiceless they sit but now her eyes upturning seek his and now beneath the lashes veil leaps a quick flame to set youth's pulses burning and now she feels her resolution fail and now gains strength anew the curious yearning for love's adventure now her fingers frail tighten about the kerchief's lacy tissue and now at last he says jill i must kiss you bobby you mustn't jill just one her shoulder stiffens resists the half encircling arm hands fend away the hand that seeks to hold her lips murmur lashes flutter in alarm no bobby no my foolish boy be bolder the moment's fear is half the moment's charm alas his mist and amateurish peck grazes the earlobe lands upon the neck readers both kissed and kissless chide not pity these withered fruits from jill's dead seas of dreaming think or in france or in this barraged city how many a dear one owes his brass hats gleaming how many a husband thanks his safe committee to some fond woman's sound strategic scheming ponder can crafts which men from want to plenty ship be steered without an arduous apprenticeship ponder nor blame my jill if she disguises love's disappointment and disapprobation if artemis in judgment now she rises the outraged goddess armed for flagellation and with a voice whose every note comprises disgust revolt pain virtue indignation drives from her father's chaste offended portals the meekest of apologizing mortals and blame not me her bard whose verses weave her this coronal of memory's budding hours who loved her long ago yet now must leave her 
Lorne mid the dance's debris and the flowers, which fade as daydreams of that first deceiver. Because, while war yet ravens and devours, while still the blind guns thunder out in Flanders, I sing the type which cousins and philanders. For, young as spring and old as Cleopatra, certain is nature's self this type endureth, on Skindle's lawn in jungles of Sumatra, she blooms, a wax-white weed that no rake cureth. From Westminster to Watts of Pura Chatra, her false lips smile, her gladsome optic lureth. Wax may be wrens, wars, peace, today's full colonel, tomorrow's clerk, but Jill is sempiternal. End of poem. Section 20 of The Judgment of Valhalla by Gilbert Franca. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. One of Them, Six, continues symptomatically terse this first of serials and doggerel verse o oh, jill my peerless perfumed powdered darling quintessence of all fairies i've adored in london's lanes by devon budley's farling at berkeley's kettner's ritz's carlton's board jill whose white hands ne'er knew rough house works gnarling whose clothes not twenty coxes could afford how shall man sing the season sea-sprung carriage in which you rolled from that first kiss to marriage what days they were what noontimes and what twilights the whole wide earth seemed fashioned for your pleasure its very heavens gold and crystal skylights where under you picked orchid blooms at leisure for others shadowed gloom for you the highlights the pomp the pride the dance's twanging measure and if one begged take coin you'd say and toss at her poor thing that skirt was never cut by rossiter dear rotten days and yet a jack grows wistful at thoughts of all the jills whom he remembers in times when he had boodle by the fistful and fires of youth where now are only embers jack's jills why muse possesses quite a listful may's jill and june's jill august's and september's yet dares no more than skim each light adventure which followed on flirtation ship's indenture for there's a tide in the affairs of flappers of those at least that west end mothers breed your wapping matrons more inclined to slap hers a vulgar trick yet one which serves some need a springtime blood tide mounting to young nappers heady as wine a mischief making mead which though a man find every known excuse for him to put it mildly does the very deuce for him and shall my sweetest muse than whom none chaster e'er fluttered to console the middle-aged time of any neurasthenic poetaster ope her full throat to sing jill's prentice rage time the unnerving doubts the certainties which braced her the follied moments in the ensuing sage time the major and the minor bards who sung to her the men who knelt the little friends who clung to her 
The last strange morning dreams, the tea trays rattle, the letters opened, skimmed, and tossed aside. The leisured getting up, the breakfast prattle, the summoning phone bell in the midday ride, the lunch, the afternoons of tittle tattle, town's latest scandal, dance, divorce, or bride. The dear boys, climbers, parties, portion stalkers, the furtive teas at Charbonnel and Walkers, the morning scented bath before the dinner, the deaf maid's fingers in the unruly hair, the risque talk of some sweet social sinner, half heard across the table's candle glare. The bridge, so much too high for a beginner. The ball, the moment's whisper on the stair. The thousand faces, phases, thoughts, books, travelings, which whirl youth's silk cocoon in its unravelings. Ah, no, not ours with huckstering pen to retail. How slumberous beauties wake from girl times dozing let huber wales in d h lawrence detail the purfled passion blossoms slow unclosing no rainbow's purple e'er shall tinge our she tale no censor's yoke restrain its swift composing moreover quite apart from muse's purity there's nothing half so dull as immaturity. So please imagine, though I know it's risky, to trust in Britons for imagination, save those rare few whom peacetime's hoarded whiskey still fires to spiritual exaltation, or such as stand when questioning house grows frisky, pat on their first inspired asseveration. Jill, as she was in times of sugared plenty, the Bond Street goddess, e tot three and twenty. Goddess indeed, these meager days that skimp us, poor mortals, bullied, badged, and bombed, and rationed. Scarce knows that breed which once on high Olympus flaunted in radiant raiment poire fashioned goddess indeed a self-sure jade-eyed slim puss of life's each latest luxury impassioned sleek mateless restless rampant supple sinewed sharp-clawed capricious and to be continued End of poem. End of the Judgment of Valhalla by Gilbert Frankau.